Imagine being Joseph Baina. It's annoying when people ask dumb questions. What did you like think growing up initially, knowing that Arnold was your dad? The latest on Arnold Schwarzenegger opens up about how he finally came clean about his love child. I've known about for, for a long time. Actor, bodybuilder and fitness model, real estate agent, and sick house DJ. It's a great change of pace. Look, at least I didn't ask you if you were natty or not, though. It's believable. <laughs> <laughs> Started seeing progress of muscle growth. Now I'm working with guys like, like Luke Hemsworth, like Morgan Freeman, like John Malkovich. Have you ever felt like you've had like a conflict or a crisis with your identity? Building my own name is really important to me because of... Oh, we're supporting each other. This is the important thing. It's great having that father-son relationship that we built. So what was life like until you were 13? You got to travel at some point. Yeah. You know? I would love to move to Miami. 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 Miami's super sick. Do you like them Latinas? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a taken man, so. Oh, can't, shit. Can't be talking about Latinas. No way, right? really? Yeah. No way, really? Is this recent? Uh, No, we've been dating like, uh, like eight months. Oh, fuck. That's yeah. awesome. Congrats, bro. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. It's been, it's, it was like before it was a while being single. I think I was single for like three years mm -hmm. and yeah, it's a great change of pace. <laughs> really great. Okay. I'm going to be real with you. I actually listened to like, I think two of your podcasts. One of them was with, um, the Stallone sisters. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then the other one was, uh, with, uh, Brad. And that yeah. one was fucking funny, bro. Dude, he's such, he's <laughs> such a clown. Funny, he's dude. Such a clown. I think the entire podcast was about girls. Yeah, he kept, <laughs> he, kept, he kept trying to clown me with the with weird with weird questions about girls. But I mean, <laughs> he's, he's just he's a dork. I love that guy. Yeah, he's funny as fuck. That's crazy though. That's awesome to hear yeah. the evolution from him hunting you and asking you about what bitches you're seeing and <laughs> now you're just about the single life and now and now wifed up yeah oh yeah that's awesome that's what i'm trying to manifest right now manifest it dude i'm trying bro i'm trying it's really funny because it, it happened when i was like you know what i got to a point where i was like i'm okay being mm -hmm. alone alone you know what yep you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna be looking anymore i'm just i'm alone i'm a lone wolf i'm just i'm chilling and then right, like, a couple weeks, like, probably two, three weeks after that, it was like, boom, we met, hit it off, and, yeah, I mean, it's like when you least expect it. It's like it's when, you always, stop, when you stop looking, then that's when you kind of find it. It's always that, literally every single time. That's how it's always been for me, which is why I'm a little bit concerned about right now, because I feel like I'm looking a little bit again. <laughs> oh yeah it's not good no it's not but that every single time i found a girlfriend it's when i didn't want one i wasn't not even not looking i actually literally did not want the girlfriend at all yeah i would literally even tell them i'm like like you know i'm i'm this young i am not ready to be in a relationship i would like be straight up honest. yeah it's not gonna happen somehow i still got cuffed up also when you're looking i feel like you unintentionally blind yourself to bad things about the the other person kind of get into um you kind of attach to the wrong person because you're looking and you're like you're like no i want to make this happen yeah instead yeah. of just letting it flow right i feel that <sighs> go blind to the red flags i need to do some internal work now <laughs> <laughs> fuck <laughs> okay in my defense I, I think i did just meet someone and i think the fact that we connect so crazy is what's getting me so excited it's starting to get me thinking like fuck i want this don't get too excited bro i know you can't get I, too know. Excited. <laughs> I know you gotta be like you know what if you know if it happens it happens yeah dude fuck this <laughs> <laughs> anyways all right let's do this intro real quick but um here bring the um mic up closer to your face all right uh, also, you can almost like you can almost like pretend like you're gonna make out with it because it's oh, that close. Yeah, it's a condenser mic, so basically it's like more of like an up close mic where it sounds really nice, but then since it's up close, for it to be heard, the surrounding sounds are not nearly as audible. Got it. If that makes sense. That was really difficult for me to explain. 
Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So today I'm actually really happy about this because you and I, I actually met Joe through uh, our buddy that most of you guys already know, uh, Mr. Josh Manoy, the Natty King. The Natty King. The Natty King himself. And um, I I don't know how, but like you, I feel like all my friends just know you somehow. Like everyone already does. I know, I know a few people. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I've been around the block. No, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but then I um, went to this place called Future Factory and uh, Joe was playing uh, one of his DJ sets and it was fucking sick, dude. That, that was, was a good, a good set. set. Yeah, that, that was, was a really good that set. Was sick as Especially at Future Factory too. That whole area, like that, I don't know, something about that warehouse vibe is just I mean, the, it's it's 360 LED screens and yeah. it's just like, it's fun. And, and it's, the crowd, the crowd there was really good. Yeah. It's like not, I mean, you got, you got like weird, weird people in every crowd, but like yeah. that crowd was very uh, fun and not, mm-hmm. there was no like, no fighting, no weird energy. Right. It was just like, everyone was just there to have a good mm-hmm. time at party. Right. There's kind of like, I don't even know how to explain the crowns, but there's like these like EDM-ish, like spiritual-ish kind of crowns that sometimes have like a couple wooks in there or something. But it's always like that crowd that's like, they're ready to just be there for the music and the dance. Yeah, it's you know? the best. Yeah, it's amazing. Whereas like, you know, anywhere else you go to in LA and you know, people are just buying tables and shit. Just Yeah, it's a little different. It's fun still. Yeah, nothing wrong with buying tables, of course, but... Depends on like the out. reasons that you're doing it for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would love to ball out if I had any balls. Big balls. Big balls. <laughs> Joe here. Joe here. You guys probably actually already might know, but Joe's an American actor, bodybuilder and fitness model, real estate agent, and sick house DJ. And uh, some people also may know that he's actually the son of Arnold Schwarzenegger, which isn't really that you know, important. Honestly, Arnold should be lucky that he's Joe's dad. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, man. Yeah, of course. I just want to say first off, because you and I were talking about this in the, like before the podcast started, but I am like incredibly impressed at everything that you take on, how you're able to like manage all of these things. Cause I thought I had put a lot on my plate, but seeing all the things you're doing, especially that some of these things require a creative aspect. And then a lot of these other things, like I'm, I don't even really know what real estate what being a real estate agent totally requires in terms of like various skill set, but it just sounds like a bunch of different shit. Yeah, it's it's. I wouldn't be able to handle. It's definitely a lot of a lot of different things. Luckily, some of them kind of overlap, and you know, with the with the fitness stuff that kind of goes right into the acting world, and um, you know, luckily the gym is also a great place to create leads for real estate. Oh, so, really? Yeah. I mean, you get, you get all kinds of people in, in the gym that are, you know, everyone's looking to buy, buy a home to get a new place to move. So it's, it, it translates luckily, but it's, it's very difficult. You know, it's, it's extremely difficult and I, I'm still, it's still a process of balancing things out because also each one of these industries is very, I don't want to say uh, volatile, but like acting is very much a world where you're kind of just on call 24 seven. So like if, if you do, let's say you do an audition, you could not hear back for two weeks or you could hear back the next day and they could either say you didn't get it. Most of the time you won't hear if they didn't, if you didn't get it. But if you do get it, they could say we're shooting next week or we're shooting in a month and you just got to be ready to go and, you know, stop whatever else you're doing, go shoot for one to maybe 30 days if you have a big role. Holy shit. So it's, it's, that's, that's hard. That's, that's a difficult thing to, to process. Cause it's like, well, how do you make that work? Especially with real estate when you have clients that want your attention, want the, want to make sure that you're going to be responsible enough to be able to sit in their house, list their house and like give the same amount of energy that you're going to give to whatever else you're doing. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's, that's all like a big process and like I've been figuring it out and luckily I've, I've 
gotten to a point where real estate's like the main thing. Um, acting is my main goal and dream. And, uh, that's where I want to be in the future. But thankfully I've gone to a place with real estate where that's my main income. That's my main, um, yeah, it's my main source of income. I've, wor I've worked really hard at it. So now I have the option to say no to the roles that I don't need mm. to get, to get to those bigger roles and you know, I can kind of pick and choose a little more because I'm not worried about the financial gain of, of acting. Cause I have my, I have my work in real estate. Gotcha. That was kind of like a big word vomit, but no, no, it made total sense. Um, so when did the, uh, when did like the whole acting process start? And also, uh, considering that you is, is DJ something is uh, DJing something you've taken on recently? DJing, um, DJing, I started about four years ago or three years ago, mm. four years ago. Sorry, this was, um, this was kind of like right after college. Mm -hmm. I graduated and we, you know, it was, it was kind of something that, that kind of like fell on me just because we. I was part of a fraternity in college. I was part of ATO and uh, nice also son. known as AT Joe. But AT Joe. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, we, we would have parties every once in a while. And, um, and the guy that was kind of like our designated DJ, he, he was really like the only one in the fraternity that knew how to DJ. Mm -hmm. And so he would play kind of like the same set, or like the same songs every time. And then I would be like, you know, towards the end of the year, I was like, man, you got to switch it up. You know, we're, we're coming towards the end of the year for the last party. You got to switch it up, put some bangers in. He was like, well, why don't you go, why don't you go and learn how to DJ? <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe I will. <laughs> and so then I learned, I, you know, I, I kind of just, um, I got one of those little DDJ 300s or 200s, whatever it is. And, um, I just YouTubed it. You can learn everything on YouTube. <laughs> like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, you just YouTube it. And after like a couple months of just like kind of messing around, there's like definitely a learning curve to it. But once you pass this learning curve where you can actually start mixing in and, and you know, you know, the fundamentals, it's fun to mess around and, and you know, play the music that you actually want to play. And so that's how that started was doing like house parties and, and my own little, little get togethers, um, like DJing at, at these house parties and, and my own get togethers for the duration of, I don't know, can we say quarantine? Yeah. You can say that? Yeah. I feel like people get like the thing shut down for that. No. Do they? I don't know. I don't know. Well, well anyways, shit. for the duration of <laughs> oh, <laughs> <for> <laughs> not that not their page, but I think like that video gets like censored or something. Oh man. Well um You can bleep it out. Yeah, let's let's bleep that out editors. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the duration of that, um it was all house parties. And then I made like a I made like a a, a big event called Joe Cella. And it Joe was like, it was, it was outside, <laughs> no it was like up in the mountains and I didn't have a generator or anything. Yeah. So I just, I kept my car running and I had like an outlet that can plug into my car mm -hmm. and that was powering the speakers and, and the, the DJ set. And like, I had like, I, I want to say like 30 to 60 people just like up in the mountains and like, it was all, all open air guys. We relax. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, it was sick. That's it sick was, as fuck. It was super fun. So then I fell in love with it and I was just like, I love like, uh, facilitating that, that kind of energy, like making sure people have fun. I loved hosting. I loved, um, I fell in love with, you know, finding new songs, finding new tracks. And, um, and I fell in love with being the guy that showed people new music. Yeah, gotcha. You know, uh -huh. when yeah, people yeah, are yeah. like, what song is yeah. this? That's the best. Right. That's the best feeling. Yeah. You know, so um, sort of, you know, playing at small clubs in Santa Monica. And that's where it all kind of like started and got really, started playing all over Santa Monica, started mm. playing in West Hollywood and Hollywood. And then um, 
this really cool disco spot in Koreatown. Um, and then I even played at, at uh, Marquee in Las Vegas once. Damn. Or twice. And that was sick. Really cool. Yeah, that's tight as hell. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not really like a career move for me. Just because I want to, my my main focus again is is acting. Is acting, and I want to make movies. I want to be in a t- in TV shows. I, w- I want to, um, you know, I, that's what I want to do. So, I don't think that DJing is going to push that mm. um, so much. So it's it's more of just like something fun that I like I to do. Mm-hmm. And if someone offers me, you know, a, a fun gig, then like Future Factory. Yeah. Um, then it's like, yeah, that's a fun weekend. Mm-hmm. And then I, I get to invite all, all the boys out and um, all my buddies will come and, and we'll just have a blast. Mm-hmm. It's pretty epic though, man. I mean, you're basically the deliverer of vibes. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the, that's the thing. Like, I love that. It's, it's so fun for me. That's the best. I always want to become a DJ for the same reason. Like I, I, I grew up doing music. Like my parents got me into like choir and doing six different instruments. So like a musician was something I always wanted to be, except my mom's super Asian. So she was like, no, you're never going to be successful to, to be an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Stereotypical. But uh, honestly, like looking at DJs now, cause I'm lucky enough to like be connected, I guess in a lot of the rave industry. So like, in all honesty, this last weekend for New Year's, I was uh, I was at Declan's in Arizona, and I was on I was on stage with uh, BTSM and uh, Slander. I don't know if you know those DJs. Yeah, Slander. A little bit less house and a little bit more dubstep. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely but, dubstep. But they're, they're sick. Yeah, their techno sets are crazy though. But um, yeah, we were just uh, and I was just literally like there on stage, like next to Lenny as he was playing his his set, and I just thought that's like seeing the crowd just be so happy when they come on is just crazy bro. yeah it's wild like you're about to deliver like like memories these people will never forget yeah yeah it's fucking sick yeah it's funny it's funny because once you um i've really had the privilege of like becoming friends with with a lot of really cool djs and you know it's you kind of get a little spoiled being in the artist section and like being backstage and this and that. And, and it's, it's really cool to just like kind of like you were saying, look into the crowd and for a lot of people, it's like, you just made their year or you just made like their whole trip. And some people are like flying here, like in just to come see you. And like, it's, it's really wild. I don't know if I, I mean, it's like a whole other level at that mm. point. But those guys are like the talent and the, the dedication. Like, I don't know if I could do touring like that. Yeah. Touring is a lot, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. I actually used to coach. I don't know if you know who Kai Wachi is. Mm-mm. Kai Wachi. He's a, he's a dubstep artist also under the record that BTSM is in. I think it's Cal- Caliban records or something. But, um, I, uh, was coaching him for some time. And it was so difficult for him because he would like be doing a set till like 2 a.m. And then he'd have like a flight, for example, yeah. at like 4 or 5 a.m. straight to the next place for him to do another set straight to like the next state, which is insane. Yeah, it's 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 almost impossible to be like super self or I mean, uh, like health conscious conscious when touring like that, because you're like back to back stops going to different probably like two sometimes two three shows in a day and it's um like fisher kind of figured it out because he's been shredded like the last year (laughs) (laughs) it's It's all that it's all that flipping bro bro he i don't know how he does it but he is like dick shredded right now (laughs) and and he's been touring like crazy like kudos to him um but like probably last year he was not like like he was he had a little he had a little gut you know, yeah. and most of these guys, like they have a little gut, but some of them. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all right. They still, <laughs> that's they still, all right. They still, they still do well for them. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. Have you, dude, I mean like looking at Fisher dancing up there, I'm not fucking surprised. I'm sure he's like, I'm sure he's like his, his freaking whooper aura ring is saying that he step, stepped like 40,000 steps oh, in yeah. a day from him, from him doing his set alone. <clears throat> Burning those calories. 
it's crazy, man. People really underestimate how much uh, going to a music festival will burn. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you end of the night, you're like 30,000 steps. That's great. <laughs> That's great. But, um, for DJing, I feel like that's one of those, like one of those, uh, those things that you took on that like requires like a huge level of creativity. And I'm sure that your life doesn't feel like you tend to have a lot of free time if I'm right. Yeah. So it's like, uh, it's, it's funny that you say that cause my, so when I work out my, my, like the music that I listen to when I work out, um, is never really like super intense workout, like what people think is workout music. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll, I'll be listening to like very sad, depressing music. Or oh, like, really? Yeah. Just listen to whatever I like at that, mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. And a lot of times when I'm creating a set list or I'm like trying to find new music, it'll be, it'll be like when I'm working out. Or like when I'm on, when I'm on the treadmill, when I'm on doing cardio or something like that, I'll just go and there's like, there's a, there's a lot of ways that I do it, but, um, I love finding new music through just like passively hearing just cause it's like whatever really catches my ear while I'm working out or while I'm doing something else, then I'm like, oh, okay, that's mm. going to catch someone else's ears when yeah. they're like actually dancing. Right. And like. You know, I kind of like to go for more of a a sexy vibe in the sets. Gotcha. You know, mm -hmm. it's like it's fun, but <clears throat> my number one rule is if the girls are dancing, then everyone's dancing. So you got to nice. make sure you got to make sure the girls can dance to whatever music you're going for. Mm -hmm. um, this is my like, that's what I just tell myself. Like every any DJ can play whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But that's just how I gauge. Like if I can see the girls in the crowd or, you know, in the club or having mm -hmm. a good time, then the guys are going to have a good time. hundred <laughs> percent. Because it's like, if the guy's having a good time and the girls are not, then it's like the guys aren't scoring, you know, yeah. the guys aren't going to, going to be able to schmooze their way out of that. Cause the girls aren't having a good time. Yeah. But if they're in a vibe, light work nice. it's like, it's like <laughs> nice. so I, I do it for the boys nice for the boys baby for the boys joe philosophy i mean I, that's literally true about every single time there's like those very small occurrences where like you have a guy that like focuses on like being his own energy you know what i mean there's like people like that which is i think nice but i feel like most of the time people that go to the clubs especially if you're a guy you're your energy and whether or not you're just going totally depends on whether or not the girl's happy. Yeah. Like a thousand percent. Yeah. You got to get it going. You got to get the, the schmoozing going. <laughs> you got to be like, isn't this guy sick? Isn't this music awesome? And then they're like, yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> you're like, what's going on? My name is <laughs> <laughs> Smooth. Riz 101. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyways, I was thinking about this and uh, I, I had this realization after I was a uh, looking into some um, stuff about you, but uh, it looks like you and I have actually been through quite a similar path in, in terms of our like fitness journey. So I started off pretty fat when I was younger and my whole process kind of like looked the same as what I believe yours is. So um, how old were you when you found out that Arnold was your dad? That's something that I've kind of always uh, known and um i've known about for for a long time but i mean the news for everyone else came out when i was like 13. oh yeah okay okay so you've known ever since like you were a kid basically um i mean as long as i can remember i don't i don't know oh okay okay yeah. okay how do you mind me asking how you knew is that did you like your mom just tell you or y yeah it was just something that uh that was known in in uh just by my mom and i Oh, okay. Yeah. That's neat. That's awesome. Was that always something that you just like kept to yourself as a kid? Yeah. Yeah. That was just, that was just, uh, it was more of just like a, <clears throat> like a fact. Hmm. Just like a fact you didn't tell anybody. Yeah. Wow. That's dope as fuck, dude. 
because online it's <laughs> online it says that you found out that he was your dad at 13 which is obviously incorrect that's incorrect yeah that's when everyone else found out yeah yeah which was a gnarly time damn so what was life like until you were 13 like if i was like a fly on the wall in your household what would i see honestly um pretty pretty like <laughs> i don't want to say like pretty regular but it was it was um you know i lived in a in a single i lived with my single mother who is an immigrant and she um she worked all the time to you know provide for my brothers and i and and so i don't know it was uh I don't know. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was fine. It was fine, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was, I'm very grateful for, for the upbringing that I had just cause it's definitely um, put a lot of things in perspective and, um, you know, kept me down to earth. And um, I've, I, you know, I was raised with good manners and, and good lessons and had, again, my, my mom and, my brothers that taught me a lot and yeah but but like like you were saying i <laughs> i just ate a lot so i was really i was really chubby growing up yeah super chubby and like in middle school i was i was like the the chubby kid in my in my friend group and up until high school like my sophomore year is when i well freshman year freshman year of high school i tried out for the basketball team and I couldn't keep up with anybody. And so they cut me first day. And I was like, I was like, what? I didn't understand because we didn't even touch a, Like we didn't even uh, dribble a ball or anything. It was just, we were just running pacers. <laughs> and I couldn't, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what level I got to, but the pacers just didn't, um, didn't do it for me or I didn't do it for the Pacers, I guess. Mm. So then sophomore year, I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to try out for soccer this time. And my sophomore year, this is like, yeah, I'm like 14, 15. And I try out for soccer, same thing. We we're, we're going on like a warm up lap and it's just a warm up lap. And all these kids are fucking, to me, they were sprinting. But I guess I must have just been really slow. But by the end of it, I was like, <laughs> I was like winded. I, you know, they were like gonna send us for a second warm up lap, and I was like, oh, I rolled my ankle. <laughs> I rolled my ankle. I can't do it. <laughs> but I, I promise, I'm really good. I like, promise. <laughs> I promise, I can do this. And so then they bring the balls out. We, you know, they finish the warm up. And I'm like, oh, my ankle's better. So like I can hop in and, no way. and, and um, and you know, the coach, like the coach knows he's like, you just, mm. no, your ankle's <laughs> no. not messed up. But you know, we, we started doing like some scrimmage games and I had no idea. I had zero experience with soccer or, or it was my first time, you know, playing, playing a sport like that. Mm. And th my only knowledge about soccer was, uh, playing FIFA on Xbox. Oh shit! So, so I was like, Savage. oh yeah. So you got expert experience. I was like, oh yeah, I know Bayern Munich. I know Manchester United. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I know. I'm. You know, we're gonna play a four-one-two-one-two, and <laughs> and we're gonna be sick on this scrimmage. And bro, I could not do anything. Like I couldn't touch the. Like I couldn't stop the ball. I couldn't. Like my passes were terrible. So I got cut right away and mm -hmm. and i was like devastated i was like man this is so shit i didn't do any sports growing up i didn't do i'm like chubby i'm overweight i need to find something and one of my best friends at the time goes um you should join the swim team and i already had in my mind like i'm gonna join the track team because there's no tryouts for the track team oh no way and the track just, team like what were you gonna yeah, do well, in track i was, I was just not. gonna i was gonna do like shot put or something i was <laughs> okay. gonna do i was gonna do one of the throws you know yeah i was gonna do shot put or maybe discus throw what do you call maybe, what do you call the thing where you with the stick you like not the javelin 
Oh, you're thinking of um, pole vault. Yeah, pole vaulting. Pole vaulting. So I was going to join the track team because one of my favorite teachers was the track coach. Okay. And okay. we were talking. He was like, oh, yeah, you'd be sick on the... Oh, that's dope. On the... On like doing one of the throws, you know? And and then... But again, my best friend at the time, he was like, he was like, come come swim. like, And I swam when I was a bit ba- like one of my older brothers taught me how to swim. And so... Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, oh, you know, that might be instinctual. I knew it as a baby. I could like as a kid, like five years old, I could swim, I could surf. So maybe it's still the muscle memory is still there yeah. 10 years later. Um, and I jump in the pool and I was I was all right. You know, naturally I had the movements. I had the um, I had the flow. I had the the rotation down pretty quickly. But the main setback for me was I'm a chubby kid, 14, 15 years old. And now I have to put a Speedo on in front of all these girls that are also on the team. So I'm <laughs> I'm like, like very embarrassed, very, very uh, shy. Yeah. And thankfully, um, men- mentally, it was just like, okay, well, I won't be chubby or I'll be chubby for a shorter amount of time, the harder I train. So it made me train even harder so that I could just lean out as fast as possible. Okay. So I just went nuts, like super try hard at like every practice. Damn. I was like one of the top guys, but for, for JV, I, they, they, I was like, I was like good enough to make varsity, but I wasn't like, they had too many varsity guys. That's mm-hmm. what I tell myself. <laughs> so, um, so I spent sophomore year in JV, had a great season, and then went up to varsity the next year. And then that's when I started going in, going into the gym. Was my my junior year of, of high school. Mm. Didn't know shit. Didn't know anything. Was doing like gym bro splits, biceps, like or like arms, chest the next day back the next day, shoulders, maybe do legs, maybe not. And then abs one day, you know, it's just like total gym bro split. And that, that, uh, that kind of was my junior, senior year of, of high school. And, um, at the time I was kind of like still a little nervous to ask my, my dad for advice. And so, Mm -hmm. so I kind of, I didn't Mm -hmm. until I went to college and I went from being lean from swim to like 169, 170 to then going to high school or to college, gaining my freshman 15. And, and I was like, I got to change this. Yeah. Cause I'm chubby again. And now, now like I can't rip off the shirt. I'm going to Pepperdine, which is in Malibu, this beautiful school. Like all these kids are like, ripped and tan and i'm like what is (laughs) i'm just tan (laughs) it was it was not cool so um my dad actually gave me that's when my dad gave me the uh bodybuilding encyclopedia Mm. and so then that's when i was like i was going through that and seeing all the exercises seeing the diet in there and but it wasn't something that i he kind of just said like everything should be in there, but if you have any other questions, you know, mm-hmm. you come to me and, you know, I'll answer the, answer these questions or give you advice. And I took it upon myself and it was still like a trial and error period, but it wasn't until like junior, senior year of college that I really started seeing good, solid progress of muscle growth. And that's when I was like, oh, bodybuilding is like the way to go. You know, cause I was yeah. trying all these other things. I was trying to swim again. I was trying to do hit workouts. I was trying to do like whole, I mean, you name it, just whatever to burn the calories, run a ton, bike a ton. And, and then <clears throat> I really actually paid attention to what the, the encyclopedia was saying and that, that like changed everything, you know, mm-hmm. I was doing, making sure to do, I mean, every, every exercise in there is, is like top notch. Mm-hmm. And then I changed the split, chest back, 
shoulders, arms, legs. And then it's like a three day split. That was like game changer. Mm -hmm. And also like hanging out with bodybuilders that I would meet at Gold's was a huge, a huge advantage. Cause then they would show me things. They would like let me train with them. And that was always fun. Dude, so I, I have like a bunch of questions that I really want to ask you because I do, I really feel like you and I have been through a lot of similar things. But basically, I've told so many people the exact same story. I'm not even fucking kidding you. Yeah. Like, there's only one difference where my main reason that got me to just make that switch was a little bit different that I talk about on my podcast. But before that, and whenever I don't mention this one thing about like, this one incident with my mom. It's always been where my parents just put me into like every sport they could when I was younger. And I was always just that fucking fat Asian kid in College Station, Texas, with a bunch of white people. I was just this total outlander that was not attractive in any way because obviously Asian men were like looked at as that as bottom of the pole, especially at the time. Um, and dude, like I was in soccer, couldn't dribble, couldn't score, couldn't do anything. I was basically just a fucking dead body on the field. And then I went to swimming too, same thing. And bro, like <laughs> having to wear that crap in in this chunky bodysuit where it's just like my stomach is just like spilling out of the shorts, bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, shit, that was literally like the most miserable feeling. And then having to swim too, honestly, like you sound like you were at least like decent at it. Like all I did the whole time was just drink water. That was my entire experience yeah. swimming. <laughs> it was so miserable, bro. It's tough. It's a, it's a really difficult, it's a difficult sport. It's so sure. difficult, dude. I would just come out of the pool burping. <laughs> yeah, you so just, bad. <laughs> your nose is running in the water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, and then I, I wanted to be tough guy. So I was like, I was like, oh, I'll do the butterfly. Like oh, no one, no one, in, no one in JV wanted to do. The I butterfly. hate the butterfly. Like, I'll do butterfly. No <laughs> I, was like, I was like, it's gonna be good for the delts. And, <laughs> and everyone was like, what? What are you talking about? That's like, fucking hilarious, dude. I'm about to lose this fat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I did the exact same thing in Boy Scouts. We had like this 50 miler like canoeing trip because I was getting the canoeing mare badge. And um, in my boat, I just. I thought that exact same thing. I'm like, if I go as hard as fucking possible, I'm going to get some ripped ass arms and a ripped ass back. So the entire 50 miler, I went as fucking hard as possible. And I was always in the front. Oh man. The whole time, just because I thought I was going to get shredded. And I know for a fact, everyone was just like, why is that trying so hard? What is he doing? Yeah, <laughs> what what okay, are you try doing? Hard. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're fat, bro. Stop trying hard. <laughs> That's funny. But uh, yeah, I had like a, I experienced a lot of the sim same things as you did, and then at one point when I just went home, I remember like crying after being bullied in school. I think I was like twelve years old, and I I think I confronted my mom about it, and she basically was just like, no, no hate to my mom, of course, because you know culture, everyone grows up from a different culture. So, uh, but she was, I was like crying because people making fun of me, and she was like, well maybe people wouldn't make fun of you if you weren't so fat. Damn. Maybe you should just, you should just lose weight then. Yeah. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll starve myself to fucking death. <laughs> and I just didn't eat for like a month and lost like 40 pounds. And then that like became the whole like yo-yo thing, honestly. Really? Yeah. So basically from 12 years old all the way up till like 18, I was yo-yo dieting hella. So like I have these pictures I posted before where I'm like really fat and then I'm also like really, really skinny and then I'm like kind of fat again and then I'm like really, really skinny. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I was able to keep it off most of the time, but I was spending that entire time training with weights except in a major deficit, which is something that kind of fucks me in the head right now because bodybuilding is my greatest passion. And right. I'm like, fuck, did I fuck myself up for like eight years of my teenage years by not giving myself proper nutrition? Um, mm. But... I um, basically stayed as lean as possible all the way to college and just like you, bro, joined a fraternity, ended up with a girlfriend. So I spent the entire freshman year eating unlimited dining court cookies and chugging 
tons of beer for beer, beer Olympics. Dude, the calf is dangerous. It's so dangerous. The dude. calf is dangerous. <laughs> when you have points, it's like, <laughs> dude, I'm going in. Our, our thing was every time you swiped in, it was always a, a full buffet. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's that's messed up. Yeah. I, I, uh, I don't think ours was buffet. I think, uh, I think ours was, I think I just had like a lot of points. Luckily. <laughs> and so I just, I remember every morning going in, getting my big old omelet, which I still eat an omelet every day. I love omelets, Damn, this- but, but I would get an omelet and they're like, you want tater tots? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You get the tater tots. You're like, I'm not not gonna get the tater tots. Oh my god, dude. I brought you know those uh five pound like optimum nutrition protein jars. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would I would empty those out, put them in my backpack, keep the lid open on the top in the bag, and um every like fifteen minutes I just shovel a plate of cookies in there. Damn. Cookies so cookies were your weakness. Well, that was your thing. I ate a lot of shit there, but I think the fact that they had all those unlimited cookies and their cookies were so dank. Yeah. I had like a that full. That was your cookie jar? I had a full like 10 pounds of cookies in, in two jars at all times. Jeez. Just fucking smash that. Yeah. Plus the drinking, I ended up gaining 40 pounds. 40 Jeez. pounds through freshman year. <laughs> yeah, it was bad, bro. That was your, your dirty bulk era. Yeah, dude. It was fucking bad, but... Same thing as you after that. I was like, all right, this is over. I'm done with this. I'm making a change. Boop. Just submitted myself for a competition so I can back out. Yeah. And then that's like where life changed. Right after college? No, it was like a sophomore year of college, I think. Around that time. Is that when was I'm, your first competition? Yeah, I, I submitted myself for to do a competition. So I think it was sophomore, junior year. It was before I was 21. No way. How'd you do? I think I got... I got third place in my class and um, the judges were like, you have the most classic physique on stage. You just need to become a little bit more conditioned and actually have a tan because you didn't have a tan. My dumbass, dude, I was like, <laughs> I was so poor, right? I didn't have any money. So I was like, okay, I am going to just do this myself and buy my own tan. I'll just tan myself. Because the tanners that they, you know, the tan, you have to like pay for the tanner there. And right. It's like 150 bucks or something. And I was like, I can't really afford that. So I'm just going to buy my own tanner and do it. Save yeah. money. Like my mom says. Um, did my own tan. Definitely looked like shit. <laughs> and then I took a shower. Oh, that day? I took a the shower. The day of the competition? After, yeah, I took a shower like before the competition bro i stepped on stage just orange like an oompa loompa damn it was so bad bro that's brutal it was so bad yeah but i had no clue i i I don't know why i didn't think that you were supposed to just keep it on like paint i just thought it was supposed to like stain your skin hello or something my dumbass it's all right hey first time yeah now you have trophies learning experience right but I mean, honestly, doing that, like committing yourself to something, I think that's like, I think that in a way, the way that we like post our pictures on social media too is the same way. Like we keep ourselves accountable because not only are we keeping ourselves accountable, but now everybody whose eyes are on us is in a way as well. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Put it, especially putting the, the date on it. It's, uh, I mean, there's all, all the, all the goals, goal hacks of like sticking with your goal is all about putting that timestamp on it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kudos to you for doing that. at like sophomore year. Thanks. Dude, thanks. It's big. Wait, when did you start? Start what? Like, I didn't like really just committing to getting shredded. Cause you said after freshman year, after well, freshman, freshman year, 15? I gained, I gained weight, but then, uh, sophomore year, I had the opportunity to study abroad in, in Europe, in Switzerland. Oh, that's and dope. And that, that was not good for the gains. <laughs> that was all just like beer, baguettes, croissants, croissants, croissants. And, um, yeah, dude, I was like, you know, I'm here, I'm here for a year and, um, I'm studying out here. So I, I'm, I better enjoy, you know, it's like, I don't know when I'm going to have another chance to, um, 
Well, I'm never going to get another opportunity to be with students, friends, and people the same age, all living in one house, uh, studying the same thing in another country. It's mm -hmm. like, it was an amazing opportunity that I was just like, yeah, I got to indulge and live it to the fullest. So I did. And that was like, so I, I, I didn't really focus on fitness like at all that year. Yeah. And so I came back. Yeah. I came back with a big old gut and not that big of a gut, but chubbier for sure. And then that's when I just went really like in an unhealthy way, just started doing like intermittent fasting without really knowing what it was and, and like training super hard fasted, which mm. didn't really help, yeah. but I did get really lean like over that summer going into my junior year and it just wasn't sustainable because yeah. it was like over summer break and I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything over summer break and I was just like living close by campus. Oh, I was taking some summer classes to get ahead. And yeah, it was, it was, just, <laughs> it just wasn't sustainable at all, like physically and <clears throat> time wise. Cause once I got back to, a regular schedule, <clears throat> you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to work around your classes and, um, but yeah, that's, that's, I, I tried continuing that during the actual school year of my junior year. And that's when I kind of started finding training partners that were really into bodybuilding, um, in my college, like in my fraternity. And that was the game changer was finding these training partners that were like mm. down to build muscle and down to grow and like get on a program together. And <clears throat> cause, and that was, that was the main thing that um, that's one of the main things my dad always tells me is like, you know, you don't need a coach. You should, you just need a good training partner mm. and you guys can do it together. If you guys, if you really want it, you guys can really do it, do whatever you want together. And so oh, that's so cool that your dad told you that, like actually straight up told you that. Cause like, that's like a bodybuilding philosophy that people enjoy watching. Yeah. It's cool to hear that from him saying like, that is real. Oh yeah. Well, I've, I've personally had, when I started going to gold, you know, right during my senior year of college mm -hmm. was when I really started going to gold weekly, biweekly. Um, um, and that's when I started meeting all these other bodybuilders, meeting like the the community there at Gold's. And if you don't know, Gold's Venice is like very much uh, a community. It's like very much like a, everyone kind of knows everyone. And not to like scare people away from going there, but it's, it's cool in that, <clears throat> excuse me. It's cool in that aspect because you go there for a month and you already know like half the gym. And I love that, you know, everyone's so nice. Everyone is willing to help out. But at the time there were a lot of coaches there, a lot of like random coaches that I had never met before. And they all wanted to train me. Oh, and, whoa, like, that's they, dope. Were, they were like, they were like, what do you want to do? You want to get into bodybuilding? And I was like, were they secretly like, we're going to make the next Arnold. Yeah. Yeah. Pro <laughs> probably, probably in their, in their heads, they were like, oh, this is a great opportunity. And like, <laughs> this is, funny. we're going to fucking, we're going to make this guy huge. And, and you know, we're going to make a lot of money off this guy. But that was, that was the main thing. Um, yeah. So, so all these coaches started reaching out to me and, they were like, if you want to take bodybuilding seriously, you got to, you know, you should work with me. And, and everyone had a pitch and I was like, I'm just training cause it's fun, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I want to look good and I want to look better than I did mm -hmm. last month and last week and yesterday. So that's, that's my main thing. And, and so I went to, I, I told my dad about it and I was like, Hey, all these coaches are reaching out to me and they want to train me and they are saying this and that and and we can win some competitions and he was like no, no no you should like you don't need that you you need a you need a solid training partner and then you can really you can do like a lot of damage with just a training partner you know you don't really need a coach and so i took that to heart and like 
all the training partners that I've had throughout the years have been freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had guys that have, I've like, uh, my main goal was to deadlift, um, to get my deadlift up. So it went from like three, like 315 to, to like 550 something or 540 something. I don't know what the, like f five plates and uh 25. That's <laughs> 545. Is right? that 545? I believe so. Cause 495 is five plates. So yeah. 545. So 545. And I was like, I was like, yes, just to be above five plates. I was like, fuck yeah, this is, this is awesome. So I did that with a partner and then benched like, you know, went from to the 225, the bro, the bro bench to, to like getting over 315. I think it got to like, uh, I think that only got to like 325. And I was like, okay, I'm happy with that. And then <laughs> same, same with the, the squat getting like above, um, getting to like four plates was like big, really big for me because mm -hmm. my, my squat had been shit, like really bad for the longest time. And I've always, my mobility is terrible. Mm -hmm. My hips get so tight. Mm -hmm. And then I also just same. blame it on my long shins and femur. You so have a long just, femur? Yeah, long, I just I just say that, long, but half no. of the people are like, "No, nah, it's not real." And I'm like, "It's real." No, it's real. It's well, I don't. I haven't looked at your femurs, <laughs> but I got long I don't legs. Look, I got, at, look at my boys' femurs until we get a little closer. But we're we're gonna look at the femurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, long so femurs getting, makes it a lot harder, though, for sure. Yeah, yeah, hundred so percent. Like I I have to squat with um with something under my heels, whether it's like a yeah. little plate or like a wedge. Right. Sometimes it's a little two by four. Same. And it makes it so much better. But again, getting to that four plate for the squat was like, phew. but that's all, that was all for, um, you know, that was all with a training partner, mm -hmm. you know, someone that I can push myself with Yeah. someone that we can joke around, but like get serious. We can keep each other accountable. Um, right now, Josh is that is my training partner. He's like, he's like my favorite training partner. I was right literally going to say that, bro. Josh is probably my favorite training partner. Yeah. He's, from he's awesome. Janneke. Cause, cause we, he's such a character and I love joking around with him. And like a lot of times I don't think he's like, he, he's kind of oblivious to, <laughs> to certain jokes and it like takes him a second, but like, bro, this guy is, he really pushes me and I push him and like, it's, it's like when you get like that, it's, it's like a relationship, you know, you get that chemistry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, boom, we're going to, you know, we're going to take over. Yeah. And, uh, you, I've, I've always found my best progress and the most fun I've had with a, a good training partner. So that's, that's also the main thing is like, you got to keep it fun at the same time, you know, cause then it's like, what are you training for? You just, you know, you want to be, you want to look good and that's great, but you got to make it fun. You know, you got to have a good time doing it. No, hundred percent. You're just like miserable and with abs. That kind of sucks. With abs, <laughs> you're just miserable with abs and some pecs. Or me, miserable without abs. Miserable without abs, and you know. But then you can eat whatever. No, I'm just <laughs> God, dude, I'm I'm bulking right now, and it's. I thought it was going to be fun because I got to eat whatever, and it is. But like eight nine months in, and man, it fucking sucks. Nine months of bulking. Nine months of bulking so far. That doesn't com compute. Wait, what do you mean? How are you doing nine months of bulking? Wait, how? Wait, why? Just get shredded. Just get shredded. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but but what's the... I don't know. See, I've never really understood the... Uh, I've, I've never... I mean, I'm just not very like scientific with it. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a big counter. I'm not a big uh, like... I'm not super meticulous okay. with with the diet and the mm -hmm. calories and the the macros as one would say. So, I don't know. When I hear some of these guys like some of my buddies at Gold's Gym that are that are, you know, they go in there and they're like, "Dude, I, I'm eating like 5, 6,000 calories a day and I have to, you know, I woke up and I ate this two breakfast burritos and then I came and worked out and now I got to go eat this and then eat I'm like 
dude, I don't think they were doing that. Like, I don't think they were doing that back in the day. Wait, really? I don't think so. Like I never, I never seen, um, I never seen like Lou Ferrigno or my dad or, you know, Franco and, and those guys like, like bulking, you know, I always just saw them like eating. Yeah. They, they ate like a lot of protein, but I just never saw them like go on a bulk, you know, I don't know, but also my, my progress maybe would have been faster if I just watched everything and I counted Mm -hmm. and I went on a bulk for nine months. So it totally depends on who you are, right? Right. So some people, some people don't need to, you know, like maybe you can just eat more and you'll have enough. Cause just like you and I said, you and I were fat when we were little. So we also have a different perspective around bulking. Like we don't, we don't really want to do it, you know? And I think that's what it is. I think you're right. Yeah. It's a big part. It's like, why the fuck is that necessary? Yeah. To put myself back I, in the I, opposite I place. can gain weight really quick. Yeah. Which is like losing weight is the hard part for right. me. That's where you actually have to calorie restrict. You feel yeah. it. Yeah, not fun. Whereas bulking, you probably don't really feel that at all. You're just like, oh man, life is good. Yeah, well, it's it's ass because it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> I was I was uh I was gonna do this movie um and I'm playing high school and they're like, you know, for high school I, I'm too big for a high school kid. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Oh, well then I'll lose some weight. I'll lose I'll go I'll go down to because I'm like two hundred. Mm-hmm. Like 195, 200. And I was like, yeah, I'll go down to 180, 185. Easy. Light work. And so I stopped, you know, I was going to the gym like three times a week instead of six times a week. And then mm-hmm. I was doing cycling. I was um, I was swimming again. I was running and doing all these exercises. And then next thing you know, I step in the gym one time or like I eat big one time and it's like the weight just packs back on right? so quick. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Like I just worked my ass off for like three, <laughs> three weeks, four weeks eating like so clean, working like crazy, doing so much cardio. And then I eat like a huge meal and like, you know, have like a good weight workout mm-hmm. and, and I'm just like, I've packed it back on. Mm-hmm. So I think it de- it depends on if it, if that makes someone feel good, which a lot of times it does. That's the best route of action. But I think for a lot of other people like me, and maybe in your case, counting probably would have helped a lot. Um, simply because at least getting to know exactly how much you're losing every day in a quantitative measure, just like seeing the engagement on Instagram or whatever on your socials, you know exactly where it's going. And the moment you gain weight for like one day, you know that you haven't just gained your fat back because of the calorie restriction, because of the calories that you know you've consumed. That means you know for a fact, and you can remind yourself with a lot more reassurance and confidence, this is just a whole lot of water, like a whole lot of water. Yeah. Which is going to just go away again in like three, four days or something. Yeah, that's true. So it's, it's a mind fuck though. That's why, that's why, I, that's why I had to start counting is cause I just, you know, I did all those fluctuations already and it was a mind fuck for me. And I was like, why the fuck am I still fat? Yeah. And then I just decided to start counting for yeah. the competitions. Maybe I got to sign myself up like you did sophomore year and for a competition. Yeah. <laughs> just, just go for it. That way I keep myself accountable. Shit makes you do it, man. It makes you go the extra mile and just do everything. Yeah. I right? mean, you don't want to step on stage and be like, Oh, I should have dieted harder. Yeah. Cause that's always, I mean, that's always the, the case though. Mm-hmm. Everyone wishes they dieted like a little, a little harder. Yeah. So my last pro show though, that one, I thought I was going to die at the very end. So I was like, if oh, I have really? to die any harder then I'm just going to, I I was eating 1100 calories like the last three weeks before my show. Yeah, that sounds terrible. <laughs> that sounds ass. It's ass, bro. <laughs> it's so ass. Oh, it's funny. like, you know what's the worst when it's just every minute of your day, you just want to pass. For like, You're like so tired. Yeah. Like imagine like you have six weeks left and you don't care about anything for those six weeks. You just want it to be over with. Like 
it's it's a fun it's it's awesome because it's hard right and when you achieve something that's amazing but aside from that if that didn't exist i would never ever want to wait for six weeks of my life to pass i would never want like time is our greatest currency i would never want just like my life to be over (laughs) that's such a bad perspective it's brutal it sounds brutal maybe one day maybe one day I think you'd fucking do savage though, bro. And you have a mad... I love the posing, dude. You have a mad vacuum too. Yeah, it's fun. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. Again, the acting is is number one right now. So I just uh, want to keep pushing that before I uh, decide to do a competition. And mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, we, we ha- like, I have some great films coming out soon. So I'm excited, man. I'm really excited. There's some, and then this year is is uh, looking great. We got we got some fun new projects coming up. Movie called Suspension, Gunner, which is with uh, Luke Hemsworth and Morgan Freeman. That's going to be coming out Ooh, this year. And Athena Saves Christmas. I'm I'm in my first Christmas movie, which is cool. Oh, shit, <laughs> that's dope. Yeah. With um, Cuba Gooding Jr., which which is awesome. What the- yeah. And, um, yeah, so, so it's all good, all good stuff. I mean, that's, again, that's the main focus and I want to dial in on that, get some sick roles and just establish my name as a, as an actor. Mm-hmm. How many movies have you been in? So far, so far, probably, I want to say like eight, eight or nine. Okay. Yeah. That's a good ass amount. Yeah. I mean, there, I mean, it's like, it's like, uh, I've, I've really been putting in the reps and like the work for, um, you know, I graduated, went into a student film and then from the student film went to like a pilot TV show, which is on YouTube. And, uh, Mm -hmm. that one was fun called scam squad. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from that went into, uh, a feature film, and and then another small feature film another small feature film and then like and they just kind of like level up and like Mm -hmm. you know i've been i've been leveling up in terms of like going from small part to a bigger part to a lead in a a, the lead part in in a, a feature film and um yeah it's 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 wild how the industry works and you know, I'm just trying to put myself next to bigger names now. So, you know, I get more recognition and I want to work with better, um, yeah, just better actors, better, better, more known people in the industry. So I can, you know, we all build each other up and Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of how it works. Mm -hmm. I would hate to be in a movie with Josh. With Josh? Honestly, I don't like to be in anything with Josh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, he's he's the man. We we were dying laughing the other day just because he was like, we, we went to lunch, and he had the the bottle of creatine just like on the table when we're all eating, and I was, I was like, dude, what are you doing? Like, you look like a crazy person at this restaurant. He's like, oh, sorry, I'll put that away. Was it the creatine gummies? No, no, it was the it was, it was just like the muscle tech like pills. Like it's just like a, <laughs> it's like a pill bottle. That's funny. Yeah, it's funny. Josh and his um and his uh secret supplement. Yeah, big supplement guy. We'll get right back to the podcast in a second, but I just wanted to take this break to thank you guys immensely because this podcast is my favorite content to create, and I couldn't have done it without you guys. Contributing to it will further help its growth and allow us to listen to more amazing guests such as the one you're listening to today. So if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by rating us a five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere you find your podcast or subscribing to the YouTube channel. And if you would like to help fund the podcast, you can do so by using Nile for a discount off of Young LA Clothing or Huge Supplements. Thank you guys again so much. We'll be right back to the podcast. Steve Aoki said that, and he's one of the greatest, like, DJ collab artists of all time, right? Right. He's of countless collabs with like top performers. Um, he said that he believes that 70% of whatever he wants to happen will never happen. Mm-hmm. So if you think about it with that perspective, if you ever want to get to that 30%, 
you got to go through the 70 percent first yeah so it's like it's crazy but it really is like a numbers game and like at the same time also just if you if you have friends if you have people that you actually care about and that you enjoy and you guys have good relationships i feel like those are the best places to go through first not only do you get to just yeah. talk to your friends and hang out with them but then your friends are friends you have close connection with them as well rather than just reaching out to people that you think are great in the industry right right plus everyone has that default perspective when they're asked something right off the bat what does this person want from me Mm -hmm. especially if it's not something you already have a relationship with prior to that right right so right. just makes everyone have like this default card i think that yeah. makes it a lot harder to get to other people and then scheduling two we already like we all know how that is and some of us have worked in corporate we understand how slow those take and how slow just email exchanging takes and scheduling sucks dude yes it sucks. Get on yeah it's like like i it's the most stressful part of the podcasting, 100%. Because you're basically doing, it's like doing a collaboration YouTube video, but for every single video every week. Which right, I don't, right. You just kind of have to just shoot out as many invitations to the people you're really interested in um, and just keep ahead of it and just keep doing it. And they'll just stack up slowly. And sometimes people who didn't do a podcast with you or weren't going to do one with you like three months ago are doing it with you now. Yeah, it's like they would. Yeah, it's true. So it is true. Like the investment builds up, and then as you continue to go, you also are able to tell people, "Hey, I've had all these people in my podcast as well." Mm -hmm. You know, it's like kind of just like anyone's creations. You, your roster increases, and as that increases, it's like your resume for other people who may be interested. Because if they know one person's been on your podcast that they really admire, then they would probably like to be on it too. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's true. Hopefully this gets you uh, some some fools on here. Yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> but anyways, um, I actually was thinking about this because I haven't talked about this on the podcast before, mm -hmm. and I would actually really like delve into this topic. But um, it's recording. No, it's not. No, it's I didn't, recording. I didn't see. I <laughs> didn't see you crap. press it. I oh, didn't see man, you press it. Bad. That is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I was Yo. like, he didn't, he didn't press it. <laughs> you know, freaking uh, Sam Selleck was on, uh, who was it? Fawad's podcast. And they did it. Fawad. Fawad. Uh, it, that's the real bodybuilding podcast host. He's also the guy who owns Hostile Supplements that sponsors Sam. Okay. Yeah. Black, black background? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. But... You probably know what I'm talking about. I probably know what you're talking about. But they did the first, Sam's first podcast ever, right? Sam's first podcast ever with these guys. They forgot to turn on the mics the whole time. The, dude, entire, the entire podcast was camera mic recorded, dude, in a big ass room. That's a heartbreaker. It was so bad. And it still had as many views as it did. That's fucking awesome. You got to put it in. <laughs> Damn. The rest of Sam. I honestly hope Sam gets all the success. He's uh yeah, he's I mean he's killing it. He's on top of the world right now. So it's it's uh I want to see him compete already. Like I want to yeah, see what, what competition he's gonna choose to be in first and uh or has he competed already? No. No, yeah, I'm ex I'm super yeah. excited to see what he just needs like in my opinion, he just needs to work on the posing because he, he has the size, he has the conditioning and um you know, I just think his his posing can can do some work, and I don't know if the guys that he's working with are going to get him that posing that he that he's looking for. Why did you never take steroids? Why did I never take yeah. steroids? Um, he just slammed that on me right now. <laughs> 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 um, I never took steroids because I I never felt like I needed to. I I've I've wanted to. And it's always been kind of like in the back of my head and the, uh, the guys that I've hung out with, the the bodybuilders that I've been around, like, you know, the environment that I've been in, it's like, it would make sense to hop on something, you know, and it'd be very easy to, to, um, to get supplied with, you know, whatever, 
you know, and, but I just feel like, again, I haven't had a, uh, the goal to step on stage. I haven't, I haven't really wanted to get so huge and, um, cause I know I can still grow. I think, I think there's still a lot of room for myself to grow and I haven't really brought myself to that, to that peak level yet. And I know I, I haven't. So that's, that's my thing is like, you know, if, if my goal was to compete and really be competitive and really go down that path of being a competitive bodybuilder, then yeah, then that makes sense for me to, to hop on and, and get that, that next level. But right now the movies, I want to do the movies and, and I don't think I, I need that for, uh, I already, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the physique that I've built for myself at the moment. And there's always things that I can, that I'd like to change things that I'd like to, to grow things that I'd like to, you know, you can always make the waist smaller. You can always make the shoulders bigger, but, um, for certain films, I don't, I don't think that's so necessary. Getting bigger makes it harder to butterfly. Yeah, I tried butterflying. Uh, I tried, <laughs> I tried swimming the other day, and it was like doing the butterfly is freaking hard now. It's like doing a twenty five is is you're already gassed, and like I tried going for the fifty, bro. I can't. I can't. Like it's it. It's bizarre to me that I was swimming like a one hundred, two hundred meter butterfly. Damn, bro. Like it, it doesn't make sense to me. And like now, now I'm like so gassed. Like, like, you know, that feeling when the, your arms can't like barely get out of the water yeah. and you're just like, like yeah, <laughs> dude. scraping it's, um, yeah. Doing that on a 50, it's, it's like, I can't believe I was doing that like five years or like what? Almost 10 years ago. I can't even doggy paddle anymore. I just like sink to the bottom. Yeah. You're just so dense. I love it. I love it. <laughs> you're just, uh, you're just building mass. Yeah. It's yeah. the nine, it's the nine month bulk. <sighs> Man, it must be how much I would love to just be Dixon shredded and have bricks for glutes again. Dick shredded walnut ass. Walnut. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what it's called? It's called it's called a walnut ass. Is man. it really? I think so. When you like the, when the pro, <laughs> <laughs> they're so shredded, their ass cheeks just look like like walnuts. They do. They do look like walnuts, and because they're all tan. Oh, damn! I didn't know that. The walnut, walnut ass. ass. You're looking it up now. <laughs> <laughs> Walnut ass. Not, not searching That's this on Google not what right I'm now. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, if ever a girl asks me what kind of ass I like. Just a walnut. <laughs> Thanks for teaching me. Uh, Sam. Um, putting you on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Look, at least I didn't ask you if you were natty or not, though. I had to ask Josh that. You have to ask Josh that because his, his physique is like, it's so good that it's just hard to believe sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I believe him. <laughs> I don't know if you believe him, but I believe him. But you know, uh, you see pictures of me and it's, it's like, it's believable. You know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't look, I don't look unnatural. Joshua looks a little unnatural. He does look a little unnatural. But I mean, there's just, there's guys like that. Like, look at Mike O'Hearn. <laughs> he's the man. You're right. I You're like right. that guy. You're right. He's a, uh, I don't know how he's so huge and jacked and shredded and um, veiny, natural. Walnut ass. Walnut ass. Yeah. Born, yeah. born like a Cialis dick. Some guys just, just built like that. Just built different. We're built different. Maybe we should just eat some duck eggs. Yes. Yeah. Duck eggs and um, I don't know. I don't know anymore. <laughs> I need Josh's creatine supplements. Oh, shit. Oh, I need all of Josh's creatine <laughs> supplements. But, it's a stack. Okay. But this kind of brings me to something that's 
related but kind of unrelated. I was actually going to bring this up before, and then we found out that I wasn't recording. But uh, my growing up my entire childhood, I didn't really understand what it was that my dad did. I just remember him basically and my mom saying uh, stories about how my dad basically came and flew to America with not very much. When he landed, someone had stolen his bag, stealing, stolen. Someone had taken his bag from the airport. They could not find his luggage and he didn't have anything. He actually didn't have anything. So for the next however long, I don't know if it was a year or more, he had to live off of his like, his like research assistant um, salary. Uh, so I don't really know how much that was, but it was completely minimum wage, especially at the time. So basically he was just eating ramen, ramen, cup ramen for like a whole, like, I don't know how long, but for multiple months, just straight cup ramen, ramen to like save money. I don't really know how he survived that Yeah, that's extreme gnarly. lack of nutrition. Wow. But doing that, they always give me that story, whether or not it's true or not, uh, to basically tell me why they would never give me anything or they would never give me any money or I had to, I had to work for it. Like when I was younger, my mom would give me $1 for every hour of piano I practiced. And that was my way to build a little money jar so I could get whatever I wanted. However, an hour is a long ass time and seven hours a week is just $7. (laughs) So, so I didn't really make very much money. Um, but I, I am sitting here now today realizing that my dad is way more accomplished than I thought. And I'm very blessed to have him in my life, even whether or not, even if I didn't really get anything from them, I'm lucky to be their child and to have been raised by them for sure. And I'm very happy for that. And I think the way they raised me is also probably productive because I wouldn't be what I feel is hardworking if I hadn't been pushed in that direction. But my dad is now like the department head of um, of a department at a very top university. And so he's very, very well accomplished and all the people and a lot of people in academics know of him. So I remember as I was growing up, I was always asked about like, what am I gonna do for my degree? You know, like, am I, like, like how, how are my grades? Like how am I looking? And then people would always tell me how accomplished and amazing my dad is. So I think that brought me to today where I did everything I could in the books. I became an Eagle Scout, played like the six instruments and sang. I was in about every sport except for basketball because I was short as fuck. Um, um, Got straight A's, went to Purdue, got a mechanical engineering degree, got admitted to UCSD. I was gonna do my master's degree in biomechanical engineering there. And then a week before I dropped out and I said, fuck this, I hate this. And um, I think really literally just because I'm sitting here today doing this podcast, doing bodybuilding, trying to go for Olympia, um, trying to make a name for it myself. I think it's all because I feel like I need to top my dad. Hmm. I feel like it's all because of like just that entire time of like my people comparing me to him. And then my mom just saying things that were like not very empathetic at the time. Right. I think it's led me to this place where like, I feel a lot of pride and like being able to do things that I know can make him proud as well. Right. So even though I chose a completely different path. So I, that's why I'm kind of curious to ask you because I did a little Q and a, which if you're welcome to, or if you're up for answering some of the questions that some people asked, um, I remember seeing quite a few questions asking about how you felt knowing that Arnold Schwarzenegger is your dad and then also how you felt and how life was different after people found out. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm very curious to because that's basically my experience and um, I'm curious what your perspective is. So which one's the first question? So I guess first thing is um, how do you feel like, how, how do you feel, what did you like think growing up initially knowing that Arnold was your dad until the age of 13. 
when other people found out? I think the main thing is that when you have, um, I talked about this when I, when I was on dancing with the stars. That's so sick by the way. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. But I was on dancing with the stars in season 31. And, um, one of the episodes was, um, most memorable year. And I did that that year was my most memorable year because I felt as though it was my biggest year of, I I had finished filming two movies uh, that year. I was doing Dancing with the Stars. And so for me, it was was like I'm establishing my own name, Mm -hmm. establishing myself as as an actor, as an entertainer, as, uh, and I was starting to get, you know, more followers on my, on my Instagram and TikTok and whatnot. And so what I, what I talked about on that, on that episode was that when it comes to building my own name is really important to me, uh, because of how difficult it can be to have a high achieving parent. And so it could be for anyone and it doesn't have to be just kids of famous people. It could be, uh, the kid of someone high up at a university. It could be someone, uh, whose, whose parents are, you know, known, really well known in their small town or has a really successful job is a, you know, a venture capitalist is a really big, you know, owns a business, owns all these real estate development. It could be any parent that's really high achieving to be a child of that is it's difficult because you're always going to be compared. You know, you're always going to get the comparison. uh, Oh, is he as hardworking as his dad? Oh, is he as hardworking as his mom or her mom is, uh, is, you know, can they, are they as smart as their parents? So that'll always come up. And so that's always been, um, you know, a big thing is, is being able to separate my, separate myself in a way where I feel like I'm on my own path and, and doing my own thing. But yeah, there's, there's always been a pressure to, to be successful as well. And I think that that's, that, um, that it's difficult. It's difficult to, to compare yourself to anyone. Even, even nowadays, I I feel like a lot of people compare themselves to other influencers and other, other people that they see that are more successful than more successful than them. And they tend to compare themselves and it's, it's really, um, hard on the brain. It's hard on the heart to compare yourself to other people, no matter who it is. And especially your parents, especially if they're high achieving, especially if, you know, they've built themselves a successful career and, and you feel like you haven't gone as far as they have. Um, so I think it's been like a challenge, but for me, it's, it's, it's also been like, accepting that my, my dad, my family will always be a part of me and I'll always be compared because that's the closest thing. That's the first thing that people think of. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's more of an acceptance thing. And I've, I've I've accepted that I'm going to get the comparisons. I'm going to get the, um, uh, you know, people relating me to, to my dad and, and I'm okay with that. And, uh, my thing is I just need to stay the course and make sure that I'm doing what I'm doing for myself and that I'm happy with what I'm doing and that I'm in love with what I'm following, the passions that I'm following, whether it's acting, whether it's real estate, whether it's, you know, bodybuilding. And that's also a question that always comes up is, you know, your dad was so successful in those three things are you doing it because of him or, or, and it's like, no, I, I just, I tried them out and I fell in love with them. I tried out weightlifting and I fell in love with it. I tried acting. I did plays in high school. I did uh, student films in college and I fell in love with it. Um, 
real estate, I just, I freaking, <laughs> like, I just got so passionate about um, investing in real estate instead of the stock market because the stock market just went over my head. I just, it was, it, it didn't make any, it, it makes sense to me, but it just, it didn't seem right for what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was build more of like um, a stronger foundation. And I thought real estate was going to be the way to do that. And so, you know, I'm not sure if I veered off too far from the question, but again, the main thing is I've accepted that I'll always be compared and there will always be a little bit of pressure there to succeed. But I know that what I'm doing is for me. And I know that what the, the passions and careers that I'm following is, is I'm following them because I love them and I genuinely care about them and they actually make me happy. And it's not, I'm not doing anything to beat anyone else. I'm just trying to make myself happy. And I think that's the main thing for anyone that has high achieving parents. Again, it could be, it doesn't have to be a famous person. It could be any type of high achieving parent. Um, just making sure that success is all relative. Success is all relative and your success can be totally different than my success and totally different than, you know, creatine Josh's success. <laughs> and uh, so just making sure it's, it's for you. That's, that's what I've found for myself. And that's why, that's what I talked about on that Dancing with the Stars episode was that year was important to me because that's where I found myself happy with what I'm doing and, um, you know, fi accepting that, you know, my family situation is, is what it is and I'm okay with that. So, yeah. How do you feel like, uh, did people treat you differently before they found out versus after? And if so, how? Um, no, I, I think, I think it was, um, it was an interesting time because it was, I had just moved. I had moved from LA to Bakersfield, which was very random, but, um, we were living in a, uh, I was living in an apartment with my mom and, I had always wanted to live in a house. And so we didn't want to leave too far from LA, but we didn't want to like, I mean, you can't afford to buy a house in LA. So I don't know how, um, at the time I was too young to like have any input, but that was always my thing was like, I want to live in a house. So my mom, uh, my mom moved us to Bakersfield mm -hmm. and we, we got a house in Bakersfield. And so, um, I didn't really know too many people there. I think I, I had did, I had done like my eighth grade there and then the news came out about everything. And yeah, I, it's not like I had been established there for so long. So and then I went into high school and then that's a whole new crowd of people. So it's, it's hard for me to like compare. Oh, okay. Yeah. To compare if, if like people treated me really different than the year before, cause it's all new people that I'm meeting. But I think the main thing was, was I always stayed true to myself and, um, you know, I never really, I pri I, I, I like to pride myself in, in being authentic. And so I've never tried to do anything outside of my, like not comfort zone, but I've never tried to prove myself or, or show off or, you know, boast or do anything like that. And, and I think that's, that's rubbed off on people in, in the right way, you know? And, and so even now people, people don't really, it's brought up, it's brought up for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's brought up, but it's like, it's never like in a weird way. And I think it's because I, I 
tend to stay authentic to who I am. And, you know, I don't, that's not something that really defines me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you ever feel like it gets annoying when it gets brought up? No, I mean, it's an, it's annoying when people ask dumb questions. You're not asking a dumb question, but, okay. <laughs> but, but when, when people say like dumb things, it's like, um, you know, it's like, why, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, what well, what was the point of that? You know, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's my dad and I'm, I'm like super proud that he's my dad. So yeah. Nice. That's dope. That's dope. By the way, uh, speaking of steroids, if you don't feel like you need to do them for any reason or anything that you're passionate about, literally don't like you don't need to. Yeah. It's absolutely that's, that's so unnecessary. It's yeah. It's, it's for what I'm doing. It's, it's not necessary. And, um, I mean like, yeah, it just comes up because it's, it would like, I want to see what, right. what would happen. Yeah. And like a lot of people are always, that's like half my comments. Anytime that I, <laughs> it's like, it's actually half my comments. Like anytime that I post anything, um, any posing pictures, any posing videos, anything like that I show my physique, it's like half the comments are like, can you just hop on the juice already, bro? Like can you just <laughs> hop on the juice. It's like, bro, people are waiting for you to hop on the juice. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fucking funny, bro. Um, I don't think that was even going to be my question until I saw it in the Q and a, I was like, that's a good question. I should ask. Which one? Oh, the, the roids? <laughs> Something related to steroids. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's definitely a lot of things related that, to steroids. That I'm sure it's the same people that asked that question. Oh, well, probably. For I'm sure. sure it's the same people yeah. that commented on my post or like, are like, why doesn't he take steroids? Right. Or plus, like, when is he going to hop on and like compete? Plus, I'm considering like, the name of my podcast, people would probably be curious. Like, oh, this yeah. And be like, is he going to talk about the steroids he takes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here's my stack <laughs> uh, but it is like a whole it's a whole it's a whole world on its own like if you want to do things correctly and relatively quote-unquote healthily and as in like proactive health like, right like more of like harm reduction it's so much dude it is so much stuff that it's like, I think that's why most people in bodybuilders, like they don't say that because they want to listen to competition. These guys are old. By the time a lot of these kids listening are going in the competition, these guys are retired already. They don't give a fuck. The generations as us as human beings, even though we are always survival of the fittest, we want our species to survive as one. And that's why we always want to make sure the younger generation is doing better than us. So we're constantly progressing and improving. So saying that there's a big reason I believe that a lot of big bodybuilders say that don't, don't just don't do steroids unless you're going to compete for Olympia, unless you want to be like the biggest bodybuilder in the world or, I mean, cause it's just, unless not, you really need that testosterone, then, <laughs> <laughs> then, then TRT is great. It's a great option, but like, bro, it's just, if I didn't do bodybuilding, I would wish that I never did it. Did it. Oh yeah. Yeah. If I wasn't competing, I would wish that I never. I know tried some guys just that just love natural. it though. Doing it. Yeah, they just like love it. I love bodybuilding. I don't love the steroids. Right. I love bodybuilding, and yeah, like taking gear will make you look sick as fuck for. Yeah, a, I think that's what it is. A small period of time, if you're taking a dryer. Right. Dude, when you when you like when you're not a teenager when you're in your 20s you go to your 30s and, and and everything you you just realize that like time happens so quickly and you will lose all of it so quickly if you just stop so yeah. like you have to continuously keep taking steroids and if you continuously keep taking gear you're continuously affecting your organs and your long-term health you're changing the chemistry of your body in so many different ways um not just in long-term ways and in ways that'll affect whether or not you are of risk of cardiovascular disease later or sooner, but it also changes your actual physical appearance and how you act around people. That's kind of a big deal because you're actually turning to a different human being. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, hormones, dude. Yeah. It's like everything. Girls talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Hormones go up and down. Mm -hmm. It's a damn shame. It's a damn shame. Yeah, it sucks. I mean, I can't imagine. But yeah. 
I'm okay. <laughs> I'm all right for right now. Yeah. You would look you you would look sick as fuck though. I would look pretty sick right now. <laughs> uh, um a little, little weirder too. Have you cuz we're talking about um a lot about like our identity and um I guess working on who we are separate from and apart from living in like say the shadow of our parents or our sibling or whoever it is. Um, but have you ever felt like you've had like a conflict or a crisis with your identity, especially in the acting world? Yeah, totally. I think the, my biggest, um, I think a lot of people go through that their first year graduating from, um, college or high school, their first year of like going into the real world or like going into finding a job and finding their first line of work is it's super strange and it's super like, especially the job market is so weird. Um, you know, you know, you could, you could interview really well. You could have a great, a great resume, and sometimes someone else gets chosen because they have, um, you know, a connection in, in the place. And so that becomes a difficult thing because you feel like, what am I doing wrong? Am I doing the right thing? Am I going for the right things? Um, is this realistic anymore when it's really, you know, things that are out of your control. So for me, it was, it was the first year, <clears throat> The first year out of college, um, I was having a tough time finding a job that I actually wanted to do. And at the same time, I was like, I'm going to start auditioning right away. But that's not how the industry works at all. You know, I don't, I haven't made a name for myself in, in the acting world. I don't have enough credits, um, in, in the movies. So what am I, it's like, it's like having a blank resume and then you're sending it to an agent. You're like, get me auditions. It doesn't work like that. So, so that was, that was, you know, I, I met an agent and he was like, yeah, well, let's work together. Let me try to find you some things. And he was sending me off for like, <laughs> like the most random auditions that, you know, I, I, I'm Latino, I'm half Latino and I mm -hmm. speak Spanish. Uh, and so I told him that and he kept sending me for very Latino auditions, but I don't look Latino. Mm, yeah. I don't really look Latino. So even though I'm, I'm, I'm Guatemalan, I'm half Guatemalan, you know, I don't really look like, you know, ethnic it doesn't it doesn't ethnically look right but i would go for these auditions and i would say you know hey i'm just going to do it for as an exercise anyways but it got to a point where i i had done like 10 different auditions for um and they were asking for you know guys of color guys of of you know totally different builds you know shorter guys uh black hair which some things are easy to change. You can always change your hair, but I would kept getting no's and the no's started getting to me at, at a certain point. And I was like, I was like, fuck am I, is this the right thing for me to do? Should I be acting? Do I just suck at acting? Am I just like really bad? And it took a little while of, um, to one, find the job and then to finally get a role and for the director and, and the other producers in that film to say, damn, we wish we would have used you for a bigger part because you're really good. And that was like the validation that I needed to know, you know, I'm on the right path. And then when it came to, um, real estate, I had gotten a, 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 a job at this real estate firm and I was working with them kind of like an assistant, but, um, I, it was a different title, but I fell in love with, with, uh, working there and I, I thought it was a great environment. And then that's also when I knew like, this is what I wanted to do. 
But before that, again, with the no's, with, uh, with not knowing when my big break is going to be in, in movies. Um, that's, that's when that was my time of like having an identity crisis because I, I really was thinking like, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I going for the right thing? Do I, do I suck at this or is it just like a hard patch? Am I, am I just like, is it, is this just the process and I'm figuring it out, figuring it out or is, you know, is God trying to tell me that I shouldn't be doing this right now? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is it? Why is this so difficult? And I think a lot of people go through that time. I think everyone goes through that time of like uncertainty and, and, and there's a risk that comes with that because it's like, do I go for it? And do I just, you know, get over, try to get over this hump of, of, um, a bad time or should I just quit and, you know, go, go the easy route, which I don't know what the easy route is, but something might seem easier. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you, would you say that you felt like you experienced imposter syndrome? I, I haven't, I haven't experienced imposter syndrome and, um, maybe I have, but the, a specific time isn't coming to me right now, but I think that comes because everything that I've been doing, I know how hard I've been working at everything and I know how much effort I put into, um, my passions and my work and my craft. And so when I get these new opportunities, it feels right. And I'm not rushing anything. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not like, it's not like what people assume of like, Oh, well, your dad is, uh, your dad is a movie star. So you should be able to get a, a, a big movie right off the bat. No. Uh, and I don't want that way. You know, I, I'm, I'm glad that I've worked in these smaller films and built, built up and uh, now going into bigger budget films, into bigger feature films, working with guys now, like because I have these credits and um, have worked and have built this resume, now I'm working with guys like, like Luke Hemsworth, like Morgan Freeman, um, like John Malkovich, you know, and doing movies with these guys. So it's, it's all, I feel like it's earned. So that's why I, you know, I can't really think of a time immediately that I've, I felt imposter syndrome because, you know, I, I feel like it's deserved because I, I earned, I really earned it, you know, and a, a lot of people earn it. A lot of people earn it, but they still feel imposter syndrome because of like, you know, they're just, sometimes it just comes like that. And sometimes it's like, um, you know, do I really deserve this? Mm -hmm. And I think if you really look at how hard you're working and you, you know that you're trying your hardest, you always deserve it. You should deserve it. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more to offer than we tend to believe. Yeah. And, and people sell themselves short and it's, it's a shame because, you know, like you just said, we have a lot to offer. Everyone has a lot to offer. And it's, it's finding out, you know, what that is that you want to give to the people and what you want to give to yourself. And I think, I think feeling like you deserve something is, is really important. And I think everyone deserves to be happy. So that's the main thing. How do you feel like you got out of that feeling of having an identity crisis? Do you feel like maybe it was just achieving that thing that you had sought out for, or was there something more? I, th for me, it was, it was getting a job <laughs> for me. It was just like working, um, because it, it was like that, that whole summer I was like looking for work, getting, getting, uh, these shitty auditions, you know, and, and 
getting uh, rejected um, from all these auditions. And so it was like, yeah, for me, it was it was actually landing the job and then actually landing um, a role. And then I was like, okay, I, I, you know, this is right. This is right. And it's a small step, but it, it's, it's more, it's more of like the, the bigger problem I think for me was, was the impatience because you want it now. Mm -hmm. You're like, I'm trying so hard. I'm working so hard. And like, I want it, it should be happening. Like I should be landing this. I should be, um, I should be winning now. And I think that was, that was what really set me back mentally because I, I kept expecting to land these auditions and, and land these, these, um, these roles that I didn't deserve yet. And, and so that was, that was, that was the main thing. And then that, that keep, that kept me from, from growing because I kept, instead of saying like, okay, well, how can I improve? I was just saying like, I should be, I should be getting these movie roles. So it took me a little while to realize that. And then now, now, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about how the audition process goes. I learned how the uh, self taping goes. I know how the casting goes and you know what they're looking for, what they're expecting. And I also have so much more experience on set and like, I know what it's like to be on set. And, and that's like a huge thing too. So, and being pleasant on set because no one wants to work with a grouch or like someone that's not pleasant mm -hmm. to, uh, even if they're like a top actor, it's still like, you know, Oh, he's a top actor, but he's miserable to work with. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, we don't really want to do that to our, to our crew, to our, to the rest of our cast. So let's get someone else. So that's also a, a, a learning thing. Like, and I've never been a miserable guy on, <laughs> on set, but I just, you know, that's something that you realize is like, that's important. And I think for many of us is often hard to do because the way we act is very susceptible to how we're feeling that day. Yeah. But, but the impatience thing is, is so huge, especially now with, with social media being such a big, such a big thing. It's, it's so hard on your self esteem because you see all these other guys that are blowing up and having all these, all this success. And you're like, the comparisons, it's like, it's not fair to yourself to, con to compare to anyone, you know? And so you see this on social media and you're like, well, you know, the comparisons aren't fair one. And then you just put more pressure on yourself to be and chase these other guys mm -hmm. instead of, instead of being on your own path and worrying mm -hmm. about yourself. And that's something I've fallen to also, you know, I see other guys on, on, on Instagram, on, on TikTok, And I'm like, damn, how do they do it? Like, like there's no way that like, how did they, how did they land that role? Like, how did they, and, um, you know, but it's, it, that takes away from myself instead of focusing on myself and being my own person and being my own, um, you know, character. And so that's, that was something that I learned a while ago too. And it's, I hope everyone else can, can siphon through. Cause it's, it's, again, it's, it's hard as, like, especially with bodybuilding, you know, especially with bodybuilding and you see these guy, a lot of, a lot of, to an outsider, a lot of the fitness content is the same. You know, you, you, you put an exercise, you put some posing, you put some cool pictures of you with the abs and, and your biceps. And it's like, what's the, di what different, like what differentiates one from another. And so as a content creator, you're like, well, my content is better, but you see someone else blowing up bigger than you. And so then that, that creates like a big pressure on you. It's like, well, what's, 
why is he blowing up? Why aren't I blowing up? You know? So it's wild. It's like the social media thing is, I think is pretty, it can be hard on, on people Mm -hmm. for sure. It's just so hard to remind ourselves that we're completely different human beings in a completely different universe. Like, yeah, no one is you. No one will ever be you, you know? Well, that comes back to the, the authenticity thing. Authenticity is key. And I think, I think you've done so well because you've been authentic to who you are and you've, you know, especially with your podcast, like, like we were talking about earlier, it's like you've been able to express who you are on your podcast, aside from, you know, the bodybuilding and the weight training. And I think that's been super huge for you. And that's been super huge for your followers because they can see your authentic self. And that's what sets, sets you apart from just the, the, the next creator, you know, cause you're, you are like, uh, a specific personality and you are, you have your own identity and that's, I think that's huge. So kudos to you, man. Like you built, you built like a, you know, you built like a, a great following and a great, a great podcast. So it's awesome. Thanks brother. I could say the same about you. Yeah. Thanks dude. <laughs> so I got a, a little Q and A if you're uh, up to answer some of these questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we already answered this, but it's Wizzy asked, why didn't he get sauced up and follow in his dad's footsteps? <laughs> we already answered that. <laughs> the sauce. That's just further proving our point that you're creating your own path. Shane asks, did, blech, okay, yeah, Shane KMW. Shane KMW asks, did you keep up with your dance training? No. <laughs> no, I wish I got, you know, the, ne- the new season of, uh, dancing with the stars, um, dance partner, Daniela, she was with, uh, Jason Mraz and man, they crushed. I mean, they got set, they, they, they got second place and, you know, I was really, um, <laughs> I was really like, damn, I should have kept up with, with my dance training. I, you know what, that, that makes me think that I should actually, I should meet with Daniela and, and Pasha soon um, and, and get back on the dance grind because, it, dude, it's so fun. It's really fun. Like learning the, the, the cha-cha, the, the waltz is my least favorite. Oh, really? It was just hard. It was just really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I have nightmares from the waltz, but um, the cha-cha was great. The, the jive was fun. The Charleston was also really fun. The Argentine tango. Now that sexy. Mm. That's a good one. That's a really good one. But I want to, you know, I want to get better at salsa. I want to keep it going. So thanks for that question. Cause that, that reminds me, I need to get back on that. The tango was the hardest one for me. Tango. Yeah. Yeah. Tango is, yeah. tango is tough, but I don't know. I think, I think the theme, because the theme that day was, was, um, James Bond. Oh, that's so I was sick, like, though. I was like, I made this. I was like a tuxedo. Like, <laughs> hey, this guy's looking oh. crazy. That's what I was like. The Rizzler, James Riz, James Riz, <laughs> Riz Bond. It's definitely easy to lose it, though. I agree with that. I've I've realized I've never because I was in ballroom when I was a kid. Yeah, for quite a bit, and I rarely ever pull it out. I haven't pulled it out. I feel like in almost a year until literally like a few days ago at new year's i just i pulled it out of my ass and did this crazy um swing move i remember where i like put the arms over the head and then i like slide down the arm and then i use that slide to propel like momentum to turn them around and then i like do this spin my, it's just fucking i remember this whole like no thing way. it's like this one move that i really like because i can just at toss the girl every it out huh at new year's yeah you i busted it bust it out on new year's Sheesh. Yeah, that's but big time. That's like the only thing I remember because I'm like, yeah, I can use this to just like toss a go around. Everything else, like, like just forget. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, dude, it's it's. I was gonna say something, but if you feel like any of the medications that we spoke about today may benefit you, such as BPC one five seven, GH acetylcholine, such as tesamorelin, IGF one, oxandrolone troche, semaglutide, then you can obtain these from Trans and HRT, and the link for that will be in the bio.
If you feel like you're experiencing symptoms of low testosterone, such as depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, as well as lack of sex drive, then you can get this checked out as well by getting your blood work done at Transcend, and they will provide you expert medical analysis. Transcend HRT has worked with many professional bodybuilders and pro athletes, such as Thor Bjornsson, Phil Heath, and Jeremy Buendia. And if you feel like this podcast has any relevancy to you, I do believe that this clinic will provide of great benefit to you as well. I don't remember what we were talking about. I think we were talking about tossing girls around. Yeah, you were. <laughs> <laughs> some of these questions, so some of these questions I actually did ask, for example, um, Jono asked, did you notice people treat you differently since you were Arnold's son? Which you answered. And then uh, Joey asks, how did it feel for you when you learned that you were his son? Which you also said was something you basically knew most of your life, right? If not all of it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to answer this, but Jose asks, what kind of cycle would you do and how do you feel living up to your dad's name and what it did to his family? You know, I don't, I'm not really like well versed <laughs> in, um, you know, all the names. Psychology? Psychology. Yeah. The, I, I'm just going to go with what Ronnie Coleman said that in that one video. You know, something simple like D ball. <laughs> and uh, what did he say? Te a little test, a little D ball. A little test, a little D ball. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, some some simple, some light. Oh, shit. So that's what I I'm don't know, for. though. I like, I, you know, I just know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good sign. It's a good sign. Yeah, that's how you can see. That's how you can tell I'm, I'm a natty because I don't, I don't know, dude. Like, I haven't, I haven't really worked, like researched it very much. My opinion, just don't do trend. Just don't do trend. Trend of bologna sandwiches. Trend of bologna sandwiches. You hang out with Anna. Anna, Anna Var. Var. No, you hang Love out her. with Diana. Diana Ball. <laughs> We answered most of the questions. Oh, but the rest did? of the questions. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I ended up asking like four of the questions myself during our podcast and I didn't even realize those were the exact questions. Which is honestly a good sign. Yeah. yeah. That is a pretty good sign. Anyways, we actually went way over time because of course we always had so much stuff to talk about. But you know, I didn't talk about uh my training program. Oh wait. I just dropped a training program. Oh no shit. Yeah, so I, talk about it. I just dropped a training program and it, it, you know, this might actually fit where the, uh, where we were talking about my fitness journey mm -hmm. and starting out chubby and all that. Um, and I basically created a four, like it's a month long four week program that is based on all the exercises and fundamental exercises. I wish I would have been doing in high school. And when I started out and it kind of, it just totally simplifies it. It makes it uh, very easy to follow. And, um, you know, it's, I think it's great for building that fundamental um, platform for yourself. If you're looking into getting into weightlifting and bodybuilding. So, yeah. Nice. Okay. Stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Where, what, what is it called? Where can people find it? It's Joe Bianna's fundamental training program, mm -hmm. but you can find it on my Instagram. The, my, like the link is in my bio. I can send you the link mm -hmm. if uh, you wanted to put it right here or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> right there. Right here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how it works, but, um, and then what else? We got great movies coming out. We got great movies coming out. Can you, can you say them or no? Yeah. Like I said, Gunner. Oh yeah, yeah. Gunner, it's, an, right. it's an action film that's coming out um, with Luke Hemsworth and, and Morgan Freeman, and then um, Lava, which is a horror thriller film, hopefully mm. coming out this summer, but we'll see. And um, horror thriller, nice. Yeah, that one's a fun one. That one we shot uh, for like two months in Hawaii. And that was great. Was it ever scary being on the set? Um, no, because uh, okay. that was the hero. So I had to, I had to just, you know, gotcha. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, it was, it was crazy. Cause we, we, uh, we ventured off into the, like the West side of Oahu, which is like, um, kingdom of Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, is like kingdom of Hawaii is like the, you know, the, the local natives that, you know, 
take pride in in being native and you know they try to preserve that area as much as possible so you know they were not so happy that we were filming in their area Mm -hmm. and but it all worked out they were they were cool Mm -hmm. but that was the only like sketchy situation Hmm, interesting okay yeah cool can't step on the aina that went way over my head it's like their their uh their home the aina what is that the aina what does that mean home oh okay right oh someone's gonna someone's gonna correct me (laughs) someone's gonna correct me so hard oh bro (laughs) bruh all right all right (laughs) anyways where can everybody find you Everyone can find me on Instagram, on TikTok, Joe Baena, at Joe Baena, and um, soon YouTube also will be Joe Baena. Nice. Fuck oh, yeah. yeah, bro. We need the YouTube. We need the YouTube. The YouTube is getting started up ASAP. Tell so. me it's going to be like like vlogging your journey. It's going to be vlogging the journey. Nice. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get everything in there. We're going to get the fitness. We're going to get the movie stuff. Uh, the BTS stuff. We're going to get some of the, some of the real estate stuff. Cause I think again, it's uh, a lot of people can't be full time fitness guys. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a great thing to show that you can do, um, be entrepreneurial at the same time as, yep. um, following your fitness goals and, and building a physique, building, you know, staying healthy and, and eating right and being happy mm-hmm. and we'll get some dj yeah. stuff in there too yeah yeah good, <laughs> good shit <laughs> <laughs> awesome dude well thank yeah. you for being on the podcast man i'm gonna make sure to follow along with that too it's yeah, gonna be super for relatable for everyone so i know from my audience myself as well that everyone's always enjoyed the more relatable aspect someone who actually does go out someone who does his fitness game but also maybe manages a business so people will be super interested to see your journey yeah thanks man Mm -hmm. thanks for having me on this is this has been great yeah thanks for coming on again and thanks guys for for watching if you'd like to support the podcast the best way is to support us by rating us five stars on apple Podcasts, spotify or anywhere you find a podcast and then also subscribing to the youtube channel and clicking the bell button because that helps us a lot and uh what else do you say what do i say smash that subscribe oh yeah yeah. smash the subscribe (laughs) button bust down that like button slap that uh i don't know slap that comment section around Slap that comment section (laughs) dude people really slap the comment section around in the instagram reels these days it's crazy it is really crazy. the the comment section (laughs) is unhinged they're so unhinged bro all right guys i love you guys thanks for watching again Joe Baina. Baina? Baina. Baina? Baina. Baina. Yes, sir. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace, guys.